The Moment of Truth for a Winning Sales Approach by Charles B. Roth. In the finale of every bullfight, there is a split second called the moment of truth. It is then that a matador wins the cheers or disapproval of his spectators in the style and grace with which he kills the bull. This record was not produced for the perfection of that particular moment of truth, but rather for a far more important moment. For a moment that determines the outcome of three out of every four sales interviews in a free economy. In a moment, Charles B. Roth will explain just what he means by the moment of truth. But first, a few words about the author of this record. Mr. Roth has personally trained 25,000 salesmen for such famous firms as Ford Motor Company, Railway Express, the May Company, and the John B. Stetson Company. He is board chairman of the Silas Dean Organization and president of Basic Methods Company and of Charles B. Roth Associates. He has written 32 books, which have been translated into seven languages, covering a wide range of subjects from salesmanship to company testing and sales management. And through this recording by the Businessmen's Record Club, he hopes to reach thousands of listeners in sales and management with a message important to all of us. Now, here is Mr. Roth. During every sale, there is one bright and shining and oh so brief a moment when the success or failure of the sale is determined. I call this the moment of truth because it is such an important moment of revelation. It is, in reverse, like the final act in the bullring when the matador meets a desperate charge of El Toro with the sword thrust. It has other names you may recognize more readily. Most salesmen call it the approach or attention-getting step. But I like the moment of truth better because that is what it is. It occurs at the very outset of the sales interview, at the instant you are for the first time in the presence of your prospect. It lasts a few seconds, but it is so important that authorities say it represents 75% of the sale. In other words, if you muff this moment of truth, you throw away 75% of your chances to succeed. Most salesmen recognize this, or do they? I am sure many do not because I once kept careful records on 340 salesmen who called on me. I wanted to see how many made the proper approach, and only two salesmen out of the 347 conducted this important part of the sale correctly. Two out of 347. Is the approach step so difficult that only a small percentage of salesmen can master it? It isn't difficult at all. It is the simplest step of the sale, the easiest to learn, the easiest to do right. Why, I'm going to teach you in our brief time here together all the principles of what I call the ideal approach. And these same principles will guarantee absolutely that from now on for the rest of your selling life, you will be correct and effective every time you greet a prospect. The purpose of the approach is to compel a special kind of attention from the prospect, the kind of attention you must win in your approach, and what I want you to note carefully is this. Instant attention. Undivided attention. Relevant attention. Let me repeat those adjectives. They are important. You must win instant, undivided relevant attention every time or your moment of truth is a failure. Suppose we watch an old pro salesman in action, see how he goes about winning his instant undivided relevant attention. For this job I am bringing in a top industrial salesman named Floyd Comito. He is about to make a typical approach on a typical prospect, the owner of a big, busy, noisy welding shop. The prospect is hard-boiled. He is brusque, uncommunicative, suspicious of salesmen, and, yes, rude. 
Also, he is busy. When Camito enters, he hardly acknowledges his presence, but goes on with what he is doing, issuing orders to one of his welders. That's not a very good climate for Camito to win his instant, undivided, relevant attention, is it? But see how Camito handles it. He steps to within a couple of feet of his prospect, remains silent until the prospect looks up. Then Camito smiles, the right smile, holds up in front of the prospect's eyes a partially concealed object. The moment of truth is at hand. Listen. Well, good morning, Mr. Blake. Good morning. Hey, what's that thing on machine three there? Look, you ever seen anything like this, Mr. Blake? What is it? Well, it's a wax stick. Here, here, take a look at it. What's it for? Keep your belts from slipping. You're, you're troubled by slipping belts, aren't you, Mr. Blake? Everybody's troubled by slipping belts. Yeah, that's what I thought. But with this new wax stick, your belt problems are over forever. Here, let me let me show you how it works. Now, where are Mr. Blake's indifference, antagonism, standoffishness? All gone. Now he is all ears and eyes and attention. His armor has been pierced. Comito has his instant, undivided, relevant attention. And the sail is on its way. Comito's moment of truth was right because Comito used the ideal approach. I wonder if you recognized its parts from this incident. I shall explain them and make them clear as we go along, but keep in mind what Comito did and how he did it, and then contrast his ideal approach with the usual bungling approach so many salesmen make. I've watched a thousand of them blast their chances of selling by saying something like this. Uh, good morning, Mr. Henderson. Gux is my name, Herman Gux. I, uh, I represent the Nader Manufacturing Company. We're makers of nuts and bolts, and... Uh, I was in your neighborhood, and I decided to stop by to see if you're in the market for nuts and bolts at the, at the present time, sir. Not in the market. Glad to know you just the same, Mr. Spooks. Uh, no, no, uh, Gux is the name. Uh, thanks thanks for your time anyway, Mr. Henderson. If you ever need nuts and bolts, remember Nader, uh, Mr. Henderson. Our nuts and bolts are the best. Uh-huh, uh, sure, sure. The difference between this dreadful example of an approach and the successful ideal approach you witnessed is a very slight difference but it enables one salesman to sell and the other to fail. Several times I have qualified the kind of attention you must get. It must be instant, undivided, and relevant. In a little while, I am going to show you how to get instant attention every time you try. But first, let's see what we mean by relevant and undivided attention. Relevant attention relates to your goods, to your presentation, not to something entirely different. You could, for instance, get instant and undivided attention if you were to discharge a blank cartridge in your prospect's office like this. That would get you instant attention and undivided attention, but it wouldn't be relevant. Your prospect would kick you out for your trouble. But if you'd focus his attention on some feature of your goods, do it dramatically, do it startlingly, you would have instant attention that was also relevant, and it would also be undivided. Now, undivided attention, the kind you have to have, how long do you think you can hold it? I've asked groups of salesmen all over America that question, and I've been surprised, amused, and dismayed by their answers. I have had salesmen tell me they can hold undivided attention for as long as 30 minutes. Some have said for 30 seconds. The answer is that no one can yield his undivided attention for longer than three-fifths of a second. No longer than three ticks of a clock. It's startling to hear that, isn't it? And disturbing, because as a salesman, you have to start your moment of truth from a launching pad of only three-fifths of a second. Can you do it? You can, you must, and you will. You see, in this ideal approach we are coming to in just a moment now, we move into the prospect's cautiousness swiftly and brush aside everything else in his mind and plant our story there so firmly that he is willing to yield us a sufficiently high-grade attention for us to get our presentation across. That is exactly what happens when you know the ideal approach. You win instant, undivided attention. 
but it is fleeting. It wanes, but you are in there constantly with additional attention devices so that you maintain attention at a high enough level to develop the interest it takes to make your sale. Now you are ready to learn the principles of the ideal approach. The first step is to create the right impression. This you do if your person is right. Grooming good, posture excellent, attitude that of a self-assured professional. Your prospect sizes you up the minute you enter his consciousness, and he judges you. Do you pass or flunk his test? It's up to the way you look, the way you enter his office. Second step, and ah, and, and an important one, is what he sees on, your, on that face of yours. It tells him what he wants to know about you, whether he can trust you, whether he will like you, whether he will welcome you or reject you. The only expression any salesman should have on his face is a sincere smile. A smile isn't enough. It must be sincere. The opposite of a sincere smile is a smirk, and too many salesmen smirk when they think they are smiling. The difference between a smile and a smirk is infinitesimal. The difference between the effect of a smile and a smirk is so vast that all I can say is this. Smirks kill sales. Smiles make them. How do you know if you are smirking when you think you are smiling? You don't until you give yourself the mirror test. Look into the mirror. Smile. Are your eyes involved or are only the corners of your mouth? Practice until your eyes are in the act. Then you are ready to smile at your prospect in a way that will reassure him that you aren't there to take advantage of him. So, now here you are. You are in the presence of a prospect. You are smiling at the prospect. Your actual moment of truth has come. Go back for a minute to the little drama you heard uh, Salesman Camino give for your benefit. Do you remember that he held something in his hand, the wax stick, and that he called the prospect's attention to it immediately, and that he showed it to his hard-bitten prospect and asked him a question about it? His reason for doing that was to win instant, undivided attention in the simplest possible way by a direct sense appeal. He used what we call a short-circuit appeal. He didn't appeal to his prospect's conscious mind at all. He purposely bypassed it. He got his story immediately into the prospect's bloodstream by appealing directly to the senses. And that is another part of your ideal approach. Let me put it in the form of a rule. Always appeal immediately and directly to one of the prospect's five senses. You know what these five senses are because you have the same five in your own makeup. Uh, review them anyway. The five senses are seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. Five honest serving men, as Kipling put it, ready to go to work for you to win you instant, undivided, relevant attention. However, each of the five senses vary a good deal in punching power and effect. By far the most important is the sense of sight. 87% most important, say the psychologists, Hearing comes next with a 7% importance rating. That makes 94% of our sensations coming through just two of the five senses. The other three squeeze by with a total of 6% among the three. Does this tell you something? It should tell you this. Always, yes, always appeal in some way to the eyes of your prospect. Show him something, hand him something to read, in some way, fill his eyes and do it instantly. You may appeal to the other senses at the same time, but let this be your rule in making every approach always sell through the eyes. Please turn the record to side two for Mr. Roth's examples of powerful approaches based on the short circuit appeal. Now you know the ideal approach, the right attitude, the right appearance, the right expression, 
an instant appeal to one of the senses, preferably to the sense of sight. There is one more phase the initiates work in. It is a linkage step, linking the prospect with what you are showing him. A subtle bit of selling business, but vastly important. I can explain it best, I think, by showing you how a talented insurance friend named Bill Stubbs sold millions of dollars of mortgage insurance. Bill is a camera buff. Why not link up a hobby and business? So when he found a nice new house going up, he learned the name of its owner, took a picture of it, called on the owner with an enlarged picture of his home. This he put in front of his prospect and asked. Ever see this house? Why, why, yes, of course. Isn't that my new house? Where'd you get this picture? <laughs> yes, Mr. Patterson, it is your house, and I took the picture. I want you to have it. Why, thanks. And I'm calling today to talk about that lovely new home of yours, Mr. Patterson. Of course, why, I'll be glad to talk to you. Here is a salesman who has filled his prospect's eyes and has appealed strongly to his curiosity. What else has that salesman at his moment of truth except instant, undivided, relevant attention? What more does he need except a signed application? And that almost always came to Bill. We've come a long way in our study at the moment of truth because you know about attention, about the importance of sense appeals, and you have the principles of the ideal approach well in hand. Let me pick out some examples of powerful approaches, all based on the ideal approach that salesmen, the old pros, use every day. Let us start with the direct sense approach. The salesman we're watching is Gordon Potts, a 30-year veteran in the meat industry. He's approaching a prospect, his job, to sell a new kind of sausage. Potts has with him his props of the length of his sausage, some paper saucers, napkins, and a knife. He cuts a sliver from the sausage, puts it on the saucer, and he is ready for his moment of truth. Taste this, will you please? <laughs> All right, now tell me. Did you ever taste brown schwager with as much flavor as this? Did you ever? Well, no, I guess I didn't. What kind is it? Well, it's something entirely new in sausage, developed by the Lindner firm. Ah, it'll go great guns with your customers. So on into the presentation part of his sale goes Potts with 100% undivided, relevant attention. What salesman could ask for more of any approach? Now, let's examine the opinion approach, a favorite of Arthur H. Rosenthal, Fort Worth, Texas, an authority on direct selling. Rosenthal, or one of his men, is calling on a housewife to interest her in a Hoover cleaner. She has answered the door, and the salesman says... Mrs. Bishop, would you mind giving me your opinion of this new cleaner? We're asking just a few women in each neighborhood, and, and you're one of them. May I step inside and show you how it works? Why, yes, I guess so. Now take a hard look at the standby of all the old pros, the curiosity approach. They know what an unbeatable pair is the eye appeal plus curiosity, so they try to work in some curiosity-arousing device whenever they can. Here is how... A.P. Smedley, an insurance leader in Kansas City, uses it. His prospect is a rising young executive in a wholesale firm. Smedley's hand is clenched as he raises it in front of the prospect's eyes. What do I have in my hand? Why, I can't tell you. I can't see. Well, of course you can't. But you can now. Look. It's a 50-cent piece. Right, but it's more than that. It's a key to your financial security. Let me show you what I mean. So Smedley is writing another curiosity approach to another application. I like this next variation of the ideal approach, one in which you challenge the prospect like a matador waving his red cape. A young woman representing a letter shop is calling on an advertising agency executive. She holds three letters up in front of him. Wouldn't you like the direct mail you send out for your clients to look as neat and pretty as these letters? Say, they do look good to me. These are from your shop? All of them. Here, let me show you some more. Now consider a daring and dramatic approach known as the command. It packs power, and it has a long and honorable history. One of the first users of it was Archibald McLachlan, 
who took a safety switch nobody wanted and turned it into a large fortune, the square D switch. His approach was standardized and went like this. The salesman called on his prospect, didn't introduce himself or anything, just put a strange-looking contrivance with a long handle on the desk, smiled and said, commanded rather, pull that handle. Nine prospects in ten pulled that handle. They didn't know why they pulled it, didn't know what the result would be, but they pulled that switch. Nothing happened except they forfeited their undivided attention for a while to listen to the salesman tell them. See how easy it is to protect your plan investment? There's no chance for fire from faulty wiring if your plant is equipped with these safety switches. By the way, how many outlets have you in your plant? Uh, the prospect usually didn't know how many outlets he had, but the plant superintendent did. So the salesman, always commanding, asked that he be brought in. He and the salesman discussed the installation, and nine prospects out of ten handle pullers bought. It was a triumph of the command variation of the ideal approach. Our last variation of the ideal approach is the reference approach. You use it when some prospect or customer has referred or f a friend or acquaintance to you. You are now calling on the friend or acquaintance. You walk on eggs when you do, one wrong word, and you are scuttled. Watch how an investment salesman, Harry Ingram, a man well-versed in moments of truth, gets over the dangers. Mr. Michaels, your friend on Harrison Street, George Diggs, wondered if you'd ever found a really satisfactory investment. He feels that he has, and he wanted me to show it to you, Mr. Michaels. Now, this is what your friend had in mind and wanted me to show you. And out comes the eye-filling material, and the old pro Ingram is on the way to another close. But we haven't tackled the hair shirt prospect who does not do what you want him to. He doesn't pull the handle. He doesn't even look at the picture of the house. He doesn't recognize a half dollar when you show him one. He doesn't do anything but make it hard for you to win his attention. Remember the rule, never talk against inattention. And here is a man who won't give you a chance to do anything else. What then? Well, the real life situation we are up against is simply this. You have to contrive in some way to get through to him or get out. That's right. If you find you cannot get, remember the trilogy, instant, undivided, relevant attention. Pack up your things and get out. The old pros all do. They won't talk against inattention. I watched this happen. A crack salesman for an Alaska fishery had come 1,500 miles to make a special call on an important distributor. I was with him. When we reached our prospect's place of business by appointment, we found that 10 minutes before, two significant things had happened to our prospect. First, his cashier had absconded with $2,000 of the firm's money. Second, he had taken our prospect's wife with him. He wasn't so much put out about losing his wife, but the loss of the money so upset our man that getting his undivided attention was impossible. My salesman didn't hesitate. He was an old pro. Without even opening his price book, he scooted out to the airport and back to Seattle. It was a masterful piece of strategy. Two weeks later, he returned to find the climate for winning the kind of attention he required better. This time, he sold his man. That's one thing that can happen to make winning attention impossible. A far more common obstacle is the old brush-off. The prospect isn't about to give any salesman any attention. You call. He is perfunctory but firm. He brushes you off. You are out before you are in. What do you do then? Well, if you are an old pro, you stand up to him and force him to deliver the best brand of attention he has, the only kind you will accept, instant, undivided, relevant attention. Watch how one of the most gifted young men I ever met handled this brush off. The salesman is Joseph D. Adams, an artist. His prospect is a hard-bitten public relations man with a face like granite. The purpose of Adams' call is to cause this horrifying individual called a prospect 
to buy a picture for reproduction and distribution to millions. Adams must sell this man or no deal. You're an artist, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I have no time for artists or art. I don't like art. I think a good colored photograph would do more for us than any artwork we could possibly buy. Does that tell you where we stand? Yes, sir, it does indeed. But, but tell me, sir, how many colored photographs do you have hanging on your walls at home? Why, none, of course. But you do have reproductions of paintings or drawings, don't you? Yes, of course. Then you do like artwork better than photographs, don't you? I never thought of it, but I guess I do. Then don't you think the millions of people your firm serves will feel the same way? Another mortal enemy of the right kind of attention is the interruption. Every salesman recognizes this, dreads it, and some don't know what to do when an interruption bobs up. But just follow these few simple rules. The interruption may take any form or shape. Your prospect turns his back to answer a phone call. Or his mind wanders. He seems to be listening, but he isn't hearing. Or his inefficient but beautiful blonde secretary flounces in to announce an important meeting underway in the gold room. Whatever the interruption, the remedy is the same. Don't talk against inattention. Now, regaining attention is the same as gaining attention in the first place. Use your old ideal approach, the sense appeal. Put the interview back on the track by picking up the sample, admiring it, handing it to the prospect. You'll never find a bearing with this quality, no matter how much you pay, Mr. Barry. Here, just look at it. Feel it. This is a real bearing for you. Note this feature I mentioned before. This puts your interview back on the track. You can start building from there. Another very effective ploy, when you have a wanderer on your hands or when some interruption has raised its ugly head, is to quote your prospect's own words back to him. No matter how dull his words were to you, to your prospect, everything he says is equal to Shakespeare at his best. And if you give him a chance to enjoy his own words, he'll never be bored, he'll never wander from your fold, he'll sit in rapt attention and admiration while you talk. You said something a minute ago, Mr. Thompson, just before the telephone rang, that I've been thinking about. What you said is purest gold. You said that your customers don't buy technicalities of workmanship, that they buy comfort and a sense of well-being. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. That's why we've designed this product for easy operation, along with these high-style features for plenty of eye appeal. So now, here you are, equipped to handle interruptions, equipped to go into any prospect, however cold or forbidding, and through the magic of the direct sense appeal, win his instant, undivided, relevant attention. What happens from here on out is up to you, of course. But it shouldn't be hard to take the remaining steps of the sale. Haven't you just taken the most important step? The step that will account for 75% of your success? Learn it well, and you will be ready for your moment of truth and more sales than you ever made before. <laughs>